Well, it is Friday lunch, I suppose, and the student hub is fun. So, but but in all seriousness, Matt Baum, thank you for coming to the studio. That's right. Phew, can you answer some of these questions? <laughs> what about my favourite My Little Pony. No, Ra no, Ra no. Rainbow Dash, definitely Rainbow Dash. So. I do like Rainbow Dash. Yeah, I must say. <laughs> um, so th this whole idea about um, uh, if, if people were born on Mars, could they then live elsewhere? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but I've read a lot of science fiction. And yeah. people who, actually, science fiction tells us a lot. People who've done a lot of research into these sorts of things. And there's a famous trilogy of books, Blue Mars, sorry, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. And it talks about just this sort of thing. And in those books, the Martians, the people born on Mars, are much taller. Their skeletons are much weaker because they've grown up without this dense gravity. And they find it very hard to go to Earth. So I can completely see that being the case. If we, if people, you know, are, are born and die on Mars, generations down the line, they will, they will look different. That's assuming we can even do it, because perhaps there's something about, you know, the gestation period or even becoming, you know, pregnant, for example, yeah. that you, gravity is important for. We don't know this yet. No, absolutely. So. This whole idea, we were talking about the Martian earlier and how accurate as a description right, that, yeah. that was. Okay. The whole idea of science fiction, as a scientist, yep. how important is this imagining, this, this conceptualising from, from a lay perspective about what things might be like? See, I think that for Mars, it's incredibly important. And I think that's because for Mars, you can imagine yourself going there. You can imagine yourself in the landscapes that you see. You know, it's not science fiction anymore. Yeah. You know, the only thing that's stopping us having a colony on Mars is money. And the bad weather. <laughs> I, don't think that, I don't think that's even a problem. So, because the wind wouldn't be very strong, you know. Yeah. But um, so yeah, it, it's completely doable. And you know, I, you know, I've always loved science fiction ever since I was a kid. Um, there's something about Mars that it's part real life, part science fiction. So yeah. it's that boundary between the two that makes it more fascinating. Because there's this whole thing, and your session we're talking about the future, which is very. <laughs> Apt, I suppose. <laughs> um, but there is this whole thing that whilst, you know, you, you are measuring a lot of data, th there is a, a sort of completeness and a factual aspect to what you're looking at. But imagination, interpretation and that human aspect are something that can't just be put through a computer and modelled, in a sense. Yeah, especially what I do. I mean, I, I look at the geology of Mars and what I get is I get pictures from remote sensing. Um, I might get some results from different models. I might get a different type of information from spectral measurements. The thing is, not one single one of those things can tell you the answer to a question. You have to put it together. It's a bit like um, Sherlock Holmes. You know, it's inference, but when the weight of inference are all stacked up together, there can only be one, you know, hypothesis. It's not like, you know, it's not like a sort of catching the criminal red-handed. You actually have to work out, you know, the case yeah. and find out what it is you, that you want to know. And that's why I love it. I mean, I, it, it's, when you have time to do it properly, it is fascinating, like a crossword and maths all at once. But so. how do you then get this sort of distinction between something very, very um, specific, like Rhian and Liam are going mm. to go and look at the, the data, compare it with their models, and you're sort of saying that, that actually you need a holistic perspective and saying where do all of these fit, what may we see, what may we not be seeing as part of this overall picture. And, and there's this pressure, you know, I get, yeah. I get this real sense of pressure in terms of time, especially with mm. the world having access to a lot of this data, everyone has access to it. And so there's, there's this whole sort of balance going on. How do you then deal with, with getting that space and getting that you know, ability to look at things? I mean, you, you have to make time, which is obviously, it's really hard when you're a, a parent and a teacher and, you know, a, a supervisor of students. But, um, you know, I spend a lot of my time looking at pictures of Mars. Yeah. And I, I know that sounds sort of like, oh, that's not a job, <laughs> you know, but you know, that, that's where I get my ideas and that's where I, I come up with the hypotheses that then I phone up a collaborator in Ireland or uh, America and we sit there and we look at the same picture and we say... What do you think? Oh, no, it, it can't be that. And then, yeah. then we go back to the quantitative data and see if that supports it. Yeah. So it, it's trying to piece everything together. And as sort of as you get older, more experienced in your career, you've seen more things. And it's not necessarily being great at maths or super clever. It's just having that experience and you have to figure out which things tie in together. Mm. And, you know, I'm not advertising old, you know, old dinosaurs over young, you know. Yeah, yeah. 
but it but is. It's just a, an experience. It's going to give yeah. you an idea that things may not not seem to to hang together in the way that that one could yeah, think. Um, if you're if you're a scientist who's well, for example, if you're a physicist who's an experimental physicist, it can be very frustrating to hear a geologist talking about things that are very arm wavy, you know, to their perception. Um, you know, some of my best friends are physicists. Um, you know, my, my best man was a particle physicist. But what we do is interpretive, and there's always more than one answer. But essentially, as you collect more data, more types of observations, you begin to rule out these other hypotheses until there can be either only one hypothesis or one that nobody's thought of. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's the... Uh, that's the way geoscience works. Has there, oh, Sophie, sorry, you've got a burning question. <laughs> <laughs> Damien's asked a really good question. He's asked, um, he's, I mean, he's specified microbes, but if there are microbes on Mars, how will you tell if they are from Mars and not deposited there by some other spatial body, such as meteors or comet, uh, comets? But I'm assuming that's for anything, any dust, anything. How do you know it's specifically from Mars and not from anything else? Well, I think... From my point of view, I wouldn't care as long as they weren't from Earth. Because um, if you find, you know, let's say microorganisms on Mars, you know, if you could culture them and grow them, then compare them with terrestrial ones, and you can, you know, then trace back, you know, at what point they diverged evolutionarily yeah. from their evolutionary past. Yeah. If there is a divergence, then essentially they came from the same place. And that's interesting. But if there is no divergence, if they're totally different, if they're not even DNA based, you know, we're getting to the limits of what we might know, then essentially that means there's life out there of a, of a different origin. And that's as important as if it came from Mars or if it came from, essentially we would just send out a flotilla of spacecraft looking at every planet we could get to, to find where these things came from. Because, you know, that is there life elsewhere is such a big question and, you know, I think everyone on the planet wants to answer it. They do, and they have been. We've said, has, <laughs> <laughs> has there ever been life on Mars? Um, and most people say that there has. Is there life on Mars today? Uh, we're going for mainly no, but it's a little bit more even. Yeah. What would you say? Is that the general consensus? Uh, see, this is the thing. I, I think, I think we would, there would be more evidence of it if it was there today. All we know about life on Earth is it adapts so well to any niche, that if there were life on Mars, it would have adapted to a niche and we'd be able to see something. You know, everything, well, everything sort of takes in energy or, and some kind of a gas and releases a gas, you know, some more than others. But um, we would be able to detect that. And like I said, you know, the, at the introduction, maybe trace gas orbiter will begin to detect that. So hopefully, you know, there, there might be signs of life on Mars today. But I don't think that's likely because I think we would have seen it. But I do think it's likely that we will find evidence for past life on Mars when the atmosphere, the, the, the environment as a whole was a lot more clement, you know, yeah. just more friendly to, to life. Yeah. OK, so we've talked about the, the point of all of this and, mm -hmm. and the idea that, you know, possibly Mars might be an option to, to go and live on um, via the moon um, if we uh, kill this planet, for example, or something happens here. So yeah. that could be um, a good bolt hole to get to at some point. But of course, you know, this is very, very complicated. A lot of money is spent on, um, yeah. on, on space, um, space missions. And uh, one of the questions we asked was how much per person should the UK spend on space exploration, oh, that's interesting. Um, which is a very interesting question we asked five pa five pence per person 50 pounds one pound 10 pounds or 25 pounds um, and this is an annual amount right. and I guess it's a very interesting question when you start looking at things that don't necessarily relate to an individual in terms of the benefits mm. that they may get what do you think most of them said in terms of uh, the amount 550p a pound 10 pounds or 25 pounds pounds do pound. you 28 percent said a pound all right Next was 38% who said £10 Whoa. and 19 said £25 per person. Um, be very interesting to see some comparables and those are changing all the time well, as we're going. I think it's a lot going. less, I think. Yeah. If everyone, spent, if everyone in the country spent £10 and there's, what, 70 million people in yeah. the country? £700 million a year so on space exploration. So what How much would this cost, for example? What could you get for that I sort think, of money? I think Our that's audience about, are prepared to spend. I think that with the lander... Um, is about that price. Right. And that's in one year. Okay. So it's quite good. 
And that so bring was it on. Many, ten, many ten pounds per person, please. <laughs> well, we, we can't do that. They're going to Comic Con. They've got to save their money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you know, there were many, many countries involved in this, mm -hmm. and we've talked about how. I mean, this is an ESA Ross Cosmos. Um, we also had a question which I did want to ask you, um, which is about the uh, you know after Brexit, will that impact on Britain's relationship with the European Space Agency? Do, do you predict any changes there? Well. I ESA is different to the EU. Mm. So we, you know, for example, Canada is a, a member of ESA. Yeah. So there doesn't seem any real reason why it should. I mean, maybe it will because there's that whole, you know, continental scale cultural issue and politics. You know, we, we just won't know, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I would hope it doesn't. Yeah. But if it does, I would hope it meant that the UK would put the same amount of money into the, the same sort of thing. Yeah. But um, these are big things to do, and they're, they're better done with expertise from across a continent than they are from yeah. in a single place. But the European Space Agency isn't as categorical then as the EU, like, like so many things. And if you're interested, we had a Student Hub Live special just after the results of the referendum, actually. So if you want to watch that on the catch up, um, you can do so. There's a whole archive, and we've got a YouTube channel now, so you can go back and check that out um, several days after that Brexit um, vote was announced, where we talked about issues to do with funding, in particular academic funding, um, which was a key concern of ours right at the very time. Okay, how political then is all of this? Aside from having a, a Russian side and a European side of the Trace Gas Orbiter, how political is it when you're actually doing some of I'm this not sure work? I should say, really. No, you probably um, shouldn't. Um, <laughs> you should well, say it's very interesting. It, it is very interesting, and the reason is it was, um, I can't remember the exact terminology, it's, an, it's a, an optional mission. So within ESA, there are science missions, for example, and a certain percentage of every country's uh, budget they put into ESA goes to that mission. Yeah. Now, these are optional missions that you opt in with a certain contribution based on what you want to do. So you put in 30% of the cost, and you get to do 30% of the exciting things. So maybe you get to build the rover, and you get to you know build the solar panels a country that puts in maybe 2%, they get to build some thrusters or something. So part of it is economics. The more you put in, the more you get out. And part of it is political. You want to be seen as being a, a powerful country with a bold vision for space exploration. But of course, when things don't go well, um, for example, now we're going to have to think about what to do with the rover. Um, maybe certain countries will say, no, this is too much risk. So we're not going to put our next tranche of funding in. That's really sad. And they wouldn't have that option, I don't think, if it were a sort of a, a, a science program mission. So there is a there is a a lot of political wheeling, wheeling and dealing. And actually, in the UK, we have some really good people who are working at the UK Space Agency, who are amazing diplomats and amazing engineers at the same time, and amazing managers. And they do somehow seem to navigate the UK through the rocky roads of politics and do really well for us. It's so, difficult, isn't yeah. it? Because, you know, like you say, you, you put this in and yet so much of the data then is in the public domain and everyone gets a shot at it. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a lot more political than just having access to things because the knowledge can be used by so many more people than those who actually generate the, the yeah. equipment. And a lot of it is obviously, a lot of it is, is built by industry. Yeah. So, you know, we would much, the UK would obviously much rather a UK based industry mm. made 200 million pounds worth of stuff than uh, another country's. So Davin so. wants to know what you could do if if um, uh, Student Hub Live were able to donate the um, OU Students Cake Fund right. to a mission, which I believe is £26.50 at the moment. It might buy you a, a space-rated screw or bolt, something like that. Something that could survive in the extremes of the temperatures they have to encounter. What about if all the students um, gave the money they spend on cake, which is a considerable amount, actually, per person? I don't know. Well, if they give it to me, I'll make sure it goes to the right <laughs> Well, I'm not allowed to, to do right that, place. I'm afraid. <laughs> OK. Um, so in terms of these missions, then, I'd just like to talk about some of the, the relationship between the Open University okay. and, and yep. some of the work that's here. So we've got a, a team at the OU who are involved in a lot more than just the ExoMars mission. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us then what we're doing at the moment and how, how important um, that dialogue is between an academic institution and space agencies? So we had a big involvement in Rosetta. That's been a big success. Um, we have uh, involvement with TGO, which is going to be a success and it's already getting there. We had a small involvement with the, the lander, which seems like it wasn't a success, which is sad. And we have got a lot of input coming into the the rover in 2020, 
Uh, and that's mainly to do with looking for the landing sites mm. and working to understand how we might operate that rover in the future. Mm. Um, but you know, we, there's a lot more basic science as well. It's not just necessarily individual missions. So you might ask for some money from ESA to provide uh, a response to one of their calls for a study to find a, a new widget to do something. And we do that sort of thing. We do so it's almost like commercial contracting. You know, we need somebody who can do this, yeah. and we have the skills. We deliver that. Yeah. Um, but there's other things where ESA says we're giving money out to fund postdoctoral researchers, so our postdoctoral researchers can win those funds and do basic science. So it's everything actually. The academics here at OU are involved from the planning and designing instruments through to building instruments, through to building spacecraft, through to using the science that the spacecraft generates and, uh, and also taking leadership roles on these things as well. So the OU has got a huge involvement. And in lots of stuff. opportunity. Mm. HJ. I think we've got um, perhaps, because we know we're coming to the end, but perhaps two quick questions as okay. well that uh, we really want to know. Uh, Davin's interested in if you could choose the focus of a future mission, what would it be? And Paula is um, wondering, going back to the politics of things, what's in place to stop military country takeovers of stripping resources from other planets? So perhaps you can help us with those questions. Interesting. Have you got the answers? Well, the first one, I, I, I would go to the northern plains of Mars with a mission that had a big drill. It might be quite tricky. I'd like to drill and core down through the northern plains of Mars until I could find or not find oceanic sediments. I'd like to answer the question, was there an ocean in the northern plains of Mars? That would be cool. As for taking over military, military countries taking over other places, I don't, I don't know. Well, it's also <laughs> so, collaborative, isn't it? I doubt anyone would let anybody um, no. take their eye off the ball because it does seem like there's a whole community of people all working with a certain goal. Um, and, yeah. and equally, there'd be, need to be something very valuable, I guess, to try and get your hands on out there and, and get back or use for, for certain um, yeah, things. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything that's worth going into space and stealing, mm. you know. And also, it's a lot of money to get there. You may as well just build your own, <laughs> really. Yeah. No, so. absolutely, absolutely. No, it is very, very in-depth. Excellent. Um, uh, would, I'd like to wrap up um, with, uh, with just talking about um, uh, the rover because that's the next sort of massive thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, looking at a landing site is the critical thing that we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to do right now. So we're going to get the data from the Trace Gas Orbiter, start looking at potential sites, start looking at the data from Schiaparelli and see how that landing can be done better. Yep. Um, what would your thoughts be in terms of the work that has to be done now for the next four years when the rover will hopefully land? Well, the work for defining where the rover lands has been going on for the last four years. It happened mm -hmm. a long time ago. So basically, it's working out the geology. And from the geology of a certain site, you can say these were the types of environments. So was it wet? Was it dry? You know, uh, could life have evolved and survived here. And if, once you've done the geology, and you can only do that as best you can from orbit, then you can begin to add in the other things. Is it safe to land here? Are there nice targets? Are there nice outcrops of rock within where the rover can travel? So essentially, you're building layers and layers and layers of sort of filters. You know, you, you're not allowed to land here. That one's out. You, this is too high. You can't land here. That area's out. And so you go from having the whole planet down to a very small area. And from that, you're then saying, so which of these areas that we're allowed to go to have got the type of rocks that we might want to sample? And um, some of those areas have never been studied before. So you have to do a few years of sort of geological studies of those and trying to work out what the environments were. And on top of that, you've got to make sure they're old enough so they're not young things that wouldn't have had any, uh, any life in them, potentially. So it's a, it's a big, complex process selecting uh, a landing site. And every year, for the past three years, there's been a big European workshop where it seems like one landing site gets kicked out. So it's like Bake Off, where one after one, you kick one out. And uh, there's an OU-led one, which is in the final three. So that's good. So Very exciting. Yeah. Fingers Very crossed exciting make the final.
Yes, so. no, absolutely. No, it's all it's all very exciting. Um, well, well, thank you so much, Matt Balm, for, for coming right. and talking um, to me about all of that. The future um, is going to be very, very interesting. I'm going to keep my eye on all of that. And thank you all in the chat for having such a fabulous time and talking about such a range of things. Sophie and HJ, um, I see that most people feel part of an academic community. They've been voting on the widgets. Um, everyone's enjoyed the Student Hub Live event, and um, a lot of people are preferring that to a study skills event. I hope you're not all procrastinating out there, those of you who've just started your new module. Um, but I am really, really pleased you've enjoyed it. Sophie and HJ, can I have final comments from you? Um, well, I think I've had a great time chatting with everyone on the chat and some people have sent us in and we really want to get to those before we finish up. Yes, so there is a couple of selfies. We didn't get to print them all off, I'm afraid. Um, I like this one. This one is Simon. He's the one who started our My Little Pony conversation on my dad. <laughs> um, but he's actually sat from in the Portsmouth. library. Uh, well, no, this is Simon. He's sat in the library at the moment. Right. He's in Milton Keynes with right. us. Um, we've also got Chantelle, who's got her study buddy with her cat, who's joined us today. Um, we've got some cloud pictures. We've got one here from Christine in Essex. And we've also got another one here from Stuart in Leighton Buzzard. Oh, so, lovely clouds. Yes, lovely cloud pictures. Thank you very much. There were a few others, um, but unfortunately we didn't get time to print those off and, um, and show them. But thank you very much for sending them in, and we will be getting posted out to you soon. But uh, I think uh, one thing that was just brought up, Stu says, uh, when is the next uh, Student Hub event? And if you keep up to date of our Twitter, at Student Hub Live, and keep looking on our website and press the count me in button and give us your email address, then you'll always stay up to date with our next events because we always enjoy these and we hope to see you at the next one too. No, thank you both very much. Well, you should have spent more time printing things off and less time on My Little Pony <laughs> and Comic-Con, I think. <laughs> but thank you, Sophie and HJ. You've been absolutely fantastic as usual. Um, right, and uh, yes, do uh, count us in. So uh, go to that button on the website, press count me in and give us your details and then we'll let you know when the next event is. We're going to be busy planning a lot of those. Um, but I am very, very pleased you've enjoyed it. And I'd like to thank all my guests who've been with us today. John Mason, Liam Steele, Rianne Chapman, Jan Rack and Matt. Matt Balm, who've done a fabulous job telling us all about the Trace Gas Orbiter, Schiaparelli Lander, what it's like to be a planetary scientist and what it's like to be involved in postdoctoral research here at the Open University. I hope it's whetted your appetite. There's a Moon's MOOC that you can go and join if you've got a bit of spare time. Um, and uh, you can find out lots more about studying with the Open University by clicking on the website and checking out the science prospectus there as well. Do let us know what you've thought about this event also. There's a quick form um, on the feedback section of the website. So if you've got any suggestions or things that you'd like us to improve, do let us know. Um, and if you'd like to email us also, we'd love to hear your thoughts and feedback. That's studenthub at open.ac.uk. So we're going to keep the chat room open for another half an hour. Um, so you can say your goodbyes um, and we'll let you know again on the email when our next event is lined up. Um, but that is all from us here at the Student Hub Live. Um, so thank Thank you very much for watching and we will see you very soon.